So hi, everybody. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Marjanska, uh, who I watched give a talk at ISMRM in 2019. Uh, and I've been looking forward to hearing more about her work ever since. Dr. Marjanska is a professor in the Department of Radiology at the University of Minnesota, and she specialized in magnetic resonance spectroscopy. She received a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry with a minor in Mathematics from Loyola University in Chicago and a PhD in Chemistry from the University of California at Berkeley. She joined the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research in 20, uh, 2002 as a postdoctoral fellow and remained there as faculty. Yep. Dr. Maria Janska is interested in developing MRS techniques for humans and rodents over a wide range of field strengths um, from 3 to 16.4 Tesla and application of those methods to study various diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, dystonia, depression, and brain tumors. Um, as we discussed kind of earlier, if there's any questions throughout the talk, you can either let me know in the chat and I can ask it or feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Uh, with that, I'll let Dr. Marianska take the stage, so to speak. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is, uh, thank you very much for an invitation to, um, to give a talk. And um, yeah, as I said during, um, before, like I'm going, I'm going to be, I'm talking about a few different topics. And so you're going to kind of um, see the switch between, uh, between the different topics. And so free, feel free to ask me question. Um, whenever um, you feel like. And so I, um, I'm going to be talking about like there is a, um, the main team um, um, connecting all of those will be um, in vivo MRS. And so we're going to be looking at um, applications of in vivo MRS. Um, and so I just I will just give you a very brief introduction um, into in vivo MRS. It's a very brief one. I um, I assume that most of you know um, this technique very well. Um, but if we um, everybody is very much aware of um, of um, anatomical imaging and different kind of contrasts which are generated in this. Um, kind of exquisite images that we can get of the um, of the human body and also of the human brain and of course the information that we're looking at there is water and so it's really the water which is interacting with the different tissues um, and which exists in a different um, environment that allows us to get this uh, beautiful contrast and a beautiful way of um, looking at the different structures of the brain but once we um once we um, remove water, what is left behind is um, it, um, are the signals that we're interested in in, um, in um, studying in spectroscopy. And so, um, in vivo spectroscopy um, is, of course, part of one is one of the MRI techniques. And this MRI technique is really um, is really a way to um, non-invasively um, non uh, non look at neurochemical, uh, neurochemical concentrations and potentially neurochemical abnormalities if such exists in different, um, different diseases. And here I will be mostly looking really at the, um, the introductions that kind of works for all in vivo spectroscopy, but for the rest of the talk, I'll be mostly looking at proton spectroscopy. Um, I did not really, I could have put some other nuclei, but I ended up just focusing on proton spectroscopy. And so metabolites are sensitive to different, different in vivo pathological processes at both molecular, at molecular and a cellular level. Um, due to the fact that they are in this intracellular in nature, there are very few metabolites which exist in extracellular space. Most of them are actually located in intracellular space. Um, and um, there are certain metabolites which can be cell type specific. And so we have uh, NAA and glutamate, which are predominantly in the neuron, and glia, which are predominantly in myelin acetal. And then we have creatine and, um, creatine and phosphocreatine and choline, which are uh, both in, uh, in both cell types, um, except that the distribution of those, um, like choline, is different, um, and there is more choline in glia than in. And one of the um, kind of nice parts of this technique is the fact that area under the peak is related to two things, number of protons and the concentration. So in principle, one can be quantitative about the um, concentration. And the way we kind of get this information is um, through the molecular fingerprint. Um, and so if you, um, if you look at the spectrum that we acquire, we can decompose the spectrum into many different, uh, many different molecules. And this mole molecules kind of have a very specific pattern, very specific fingerprint, which um, gives us, uh, which comes from the information about frequency, chemical shift, and J patterns. And you can decompose, you can um, decompose this, um, 
new, what we call neurochemical profile um, into um, various metabolites. And so here um, I'm showing you um, the decomposition of this of the seven testa spectra, and you can um, we can in um, in this. Um, in the spectrum, we can identify signals which are coming from neurotransmitters such as GABA and glutamate. We can identify signals which are coming from antioxidants um, such as um, ascorbate um, vitamin C or glutathione. Um, we can also um, identify um, neuronal markers, so NAA and glutamate, as well as glial markers, myelin acid. So it's really um, kind of this. Um, uh, quite a bit of my talk is really going to be looking at um, at um, decomposing the information and taking out the information, picking out the information from um, various uh, various metabolites. So let's jump in. And so, kind of the way that um, the way that this talk is done, you can um, you can find more detail and more information in the papers that I'm showing you be, be showing you, and also at the same time. Um, it's um, it's my way of acknowledging the contribution of all the people who are um, co-authors of these papers, and so um, of course all of the studies are done in um, uh, with a team of people, and so this team of people is listed on this um, on these papers. And so the first um, the first work I want to look at is um, is the work with, which we have done in the aging human brain, and um, I will give you a little bit of detail about methods or about um, systems, but if you have more questions about it, just ask me. And so this data has been all collected on a seven Tesla system um, and um, that you can see on a, on a picture here. And in this case, um, this data is collected with the um, 16 channel transmit received um, TEM coil. And so there are 16 channels which have, um, which have, um, 32 capacitors, which needs to be tuned and matched for each, um, each uh, person um, who are part of the study. And then each of these channels is collect, connected to, a, um, to an amp a separate amplifier. So we have, so there, um, there is a 16 amplifiers which are, uh, which, um, are in parallel can work together. Um, and so each one of them is addressing each of the channels. And, um, and uh, we can then using that, we can um, optimize B1 efficiency for the two voxels which we're interested in. And the work that, that is done is, pub is published in this paper is done on this two bra brain region, the occipital lobe and posterior cingulate. And so the data, um, here is how the data looks like. So we have, we um, in the study, we had 17 young and 16 um, elderly people. And so 17 young were ranging in age from 18 to 22. And then um, elderly were people over the age of 70. So there, there's quite a bit of an age span. Um, and um, there are a certain number of subjects, both in the young and older population on whom we did the, um, we repeated the scans for, um, for um, looking at the reproducibility. Um, in our case, we looked, uh, we used the ultra short echo time steam, so um, eight millisecond steam. And you, you, as you can see, um, we acquire a different number of averages for two, two, two different brain, brain regions, and then that, that's partially to do uh, because of the B1 efficiency um, of the coil where, and, and also um, receive profile, where to um, get um, similar quality in terms of SNR, we need uh, more scans from the pieces. And one of the things you can see kind of, um, you can see here a data quality for both PCC and OCC. And you can see here um, that there is, you can appreciate the line width difference between older data and younger data, especially when you hear, look here and you see um, the major inastal, the difference in major inastal in terms of resolution of the J cup. And you can kind of appreciate the same thing here in multiplet of NAA and glutamate. And, and indeed, um, on a group level, we see a um, very significant difference in quality of the data um, in, in line width um, between the data. Even though this line width difference is only about two hertz, um, you can, um, you can um, very, uh, very, um, you can see this very much across the, across the group. And you can see that the, our standard deviation across the group is actually pretty small, um, suggesting that our data quality can be, um, is very reproducible. 
Um, and so here, um, here are the findings that um, that came out of the study. And so we we saw actually quite a bit of difference between um, be, um, between those age groups, with eight out of fourteen neurochemicals being different. And you can see that the p-value that we're using is um, quite low, um, um, considering um, considering um, kind of we I mean we. Uh, we used um, kind of co uh, correct, um, cor um, corrections for multiple comparison and things like that. But one of the things that you can see is that there is a very different, um, that the scenario is very different for OCC, where you end up seeing a difference in concentration, um, where you end up seeing the difference in different metabolites um, in OCC and PCC, and, and this, the metabolites are not always the same. Lani, you had a question? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so first of all, sorry if I missed this, how much time was between each of the scans? Because you said there are three per group. Yeah, so I mean, so in this small group where we did reproducibility, where we did five subjects, we are five or younger and um, six older subjects, the, the time in between was one week. So we scanned them um, every week and we, um, the focus of our study in some ways was um, really vitamin C and glutathione. Um, and so we actually control for time. And so the, the, all the people were scanned at the same time. Um, we also asked the subjects to refrain from eating um, fruits uh, and from taking vitamins and some other things. So we there was quite a bit of um, um, control, some control over the, their dietary um, things before they came into the study. But those people we scanned once a week. So we scanned them um, three weeks in a row, essentially. Okay, awesome. Um, and then kind of, I suppose, just tying into the, the whole question of the reproducibility, um, did you do any sort of like, uh, at some point, um, like formal assessment where if you like really test, retest, put them in, take them out, put them back in to see if there's any like immediate difference in the groups, um, maybe like the younger ones demonstrating higher like um, immediate test, retest reliability? Uh, we didn't look at that. They looked very similar from between younger and older. I mean, essentially at the end, actually, um, all the, our statistical analysis, like so all this data included all of them. We actually didn't pull them out from the data analysis. So we just um, noted that three of them re uh, were repeated, that, that for those people we had three repeats, but we actually used all of the data um, for this final analysis. Thank you. So you can see, um, so you can see that some of the metabolites went down, but some of the metabolites went um, went up. Um, the reviewers, um, and overall, I think everybody in the world seems to be stuck on the idea that NAA has to go down, um, and um, at least in, indeed in OCC it does, but in PCC it doesn't for us. And so it's always uh, interesting how stuck people are to that. Um, and how difficult it is to convince reviewers now that it doesn't necessarily have to, have to go down. But what I wanted to show you as well is there are, as we ran this study, um, there were special appearances of um, uh, things we didn't expect necessarily, although in retrospect, maybe we should have known, but we didn't expect. And so, um, which then ended up um, influencing um, how we did our data analysis, how we did um, uh, quantification of metabolites. And so one of the things that we saw was folk cerebri lipids. And so those are lipids which exist in midline, especially in older people, but not every single older person. And so there were certain people in whom we saw um, this, um, this peak, we investigated to see if that's uh, maybe alanine at a really high level, but it turned out that it wasn't, um, that there were um, folk cerebri lipids. And in, in um, we saw this um, being very reproducible, very reproducible in older people whom we scanned three times. So there were not all of them had folk cerebri uh, lipids, but the person who had it um, had it on every single scan, and they appeared very, um, very, um, uh, very much the same. This um, this appearance actually this. Um, uh, this um, peak exists only on the midline. So if you, if you, if your voxel does not span midline, you might not see the fault cerebral lipids. The other um, thing, which is which has also been shown before in a paper, is um, skeletal level. And so you can see here that there is nothing here, and you can see here in this older person that there is a very high level of skeletal. 
Um, and we certainly, in this case, the level is really, really high. Um, the other thing that we saw was um, this, um, this peak, which showed up at 3.16 ppm, um, which showed up only in certain, um, certain uh, people. Um, and it turned out um, that it has been identified before. It took us a little bit of time to find it, but um, it's an MSM. It's a dietary supplement that people tend to take when they are worrying about their memory. And so indeed, in a few older subjects, um, in, in a few older participants, we saw this peak being very high. Um, since, um, since then, there, there's, um, there has been um, work published which showed that you can actually, because you can essentially um, control the amount of uh, MSM that goes into the brain um, from oral intake on this dietary supplement. And, um, and Nana Kaiser in her work suggested that maybe this is the way to, um, to actually keep track of temperature in the brain, but also to have uh, to use MSM as a very determined frequency marker because it does not change its um, chemical shift with, um, with um, temperature or pH. Um, Skiloinacetal um, um, is something that we're going to look at in more detail um, in more detail as well. But skill, um, in 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 um, in our other work, but skiloinacetal, um, there there has been a paper showing that skiloinacetal is related to the um, aging, but also skiloinacetal can be very high, especially in people who um, drink a lot of alcohol. Um, so kind of um, in um, people who have problems with alcohol, um, that goes up and stays up for quite a bit, um, stays up and uh, only if you, only if they stop drinking for six weeks or something like that, that goes up. And so it's always, um, and in some work, which was um, published um, when it showed increase in scalonatosol and aging, um, there was not really um, any information about alcohol. So you kind of want to, um, keep an eye for the for that information potentially to be linked. Um, so there are, um, there, are, uh, there are other differences that I wanted to um, uh, that I wanted to show you and so you can see this is the same data and this is actually so in a kind of darker line you see um, you see an average and you see this um, in a lighter light you um, you see an, uh, a standard deviation across all the subjects so you can see the kind of reproducibility of the data quality that you can get. And you can see, for example, if you look here, you can see that myorinastal in older people is varying quite a bit. And maybe that's alcohol, maybe that's just different age. Um, you can see that in younger people that is not varying as much. And so you can kind of appreciate the data quality across this, um, this 33 subjects uh, because that's all the data which is shown here. Um, except I think we, we removed here that the people who uh, had folk cerebral lipids, because what we really wanted to look at is this part of the spectrum. And so you can see from this part of the spectrum that there is the appearance um, is different between young people and older, where here you see um, up, down, up, down. And here you see up, down, but it's up, up. And so you can kind of appreciate that there is a difference in, um, in appearance here. And what are we talking about? We're talking about what we in spectroscopy call macromolecules. And so um, they are, um, the, the macromolecules underlie essentially the whole entire spectrum. They don't just exist in the first part of the spectrum. They actually underlie the whole spectrum. They have a difference, um, dif different um, physical properties um, than metabolites. And so they have shorter T1 and shorter T2. And because of that, there are a number of different methods which allows us to um, look at just macromolecules themselves or taking them out from the, from the whole spectrum. And it has been shown in 2001 using the 1.5 Tesla data that there was a group difference um, between people um, between the ages of 25 and 55 and the, um, below 25. But this was based on the whole region of, zero, uh, of 0 0.6 to 3.3 ppm. So we decided to further investigate this. And in this case, we're using this difference in T1 um, 
to um, to do an inversion recovery, um, to obtain inversion recovery spectra, uh, uh, spectral patterns. So we're essentially suppressing metabolites and looking purely at the macromolecules underlying the whole spectrum. And in this case, it was done on a smaller group of people where we looked at four young and three elderly people. And you can see here how the spectrum looks like. And so you can appreciate this pattern difference, which was there before, where we saw quite a bit of a difference in this part of the, of the, uh, of the uh, macromolecules. But now we're also seeing uh, quite a um, bit different difference in terms of um, amplitude for the, uh, at 2 ppm at this peak, which is underlying both NAA and, um, and blue type. And so we quantified this and um, saw that the content difference is about 8.9%. And we looked at the fact that there is um, there is a significant difference in terms of content con uh, in terms of content between for both OCC and PCC, with more pronounced difference at the um, at uh, PCC. Um, the, um, uh, so this is kind of the first time where we not only saw the content difference, but also a pattern difference for macromolecules. And this pattern difference um, is something that is not very easy to um, take care of. Um, the content difference, if the appearance of the spectrum is the same, is very easy to take to be taken care of by the different um, fitting um, routines. But the pattern difference um, is something which is uh, much more difficult to be taken care of. And so um, this kind of this brings me to kind of the first part um, um, of, of the talk um, of, um, of, the, um, of closing the aging part. And so we just um, showed that there is, that we can use very short TE to measure biologically, um, very short um, TE MRS to measure biologically relevant changes and differences to the neurochemical in the human brain. Um, the different macromolecular pattern and content um, in the older, um, and um, in the older brain kind of leads us to believe that we should use a different um, macromolecular spectrum when we fit the data of the different age. And so this ultra, ultra high field MRS allowed us, to, um, allowed us to get the most comprehensive in situ examination of the neurochem uh, neurochemistry of the human brain. And it can pick up subtle differences in the tablets that res reflect uh, specific and in more important stages of aging. And what I want to show you kind of um, in part, so we, um, as we, um, as we kind of um, fitted our data and looked at things, we decided to investigate what, um, what happens when we, um, when we um, do not use age-specific macromolecules um, in the data and when we use the ALSI model for fitting the data. And so the, the way that we approach this, we, um, we um, evaluated few different fitting approaches, and so we had a, we had our fitting approach where we used so this is an older data fitted with older macromolecules and a stiff baseline. So this is what we considered our gold standard. This is the way all our um, data has been analyzed. Uh, for the aging study. And we, did, we also then, we, we modified things. So we also looked at what happens when we, um, when we um, uh, use the older macromolecules, but we allow them, um, the, uh, the baseline to, um, to be more flexible. Then we, um, we used um, um, younger macromolecules and stiff baseline. So in this case, we know that this macromolecule shouldn't fit the data really well because we, um, we know that there are changes. And then we did the same with flexible. And then we ended up also um, kind of running the LC model the way that um, the way that the default is run, meaning that ALSI model simulates the macromolecules, but um, and also has a flexibility of the baseline. We need to have a flexibility of the baseline because um, there are no macromolecules past 3. Um, 2, p 3.2 ppm, and we know that the macromolecules are there. So this is what the baseline kind of does, it adjusts. Um, but you can kind of already from here appreciate that this pattern looks um, really nothing like this pattern. And so um, even though LC model can fit this information, the way this is, this, it, it's fitting it is, um, does not really get you very close. So, um, but what really, what we were interested in looking at, um, 
are what are the effects for um, in terms of um, quantification of the concentration and see here you can see um, what we um, we um, did the um, comparisons where we as we um, took the first um, approach as a gold standard and then we made the comparison across the other approaches and then we considered anything um, which had a p-value below that was significantly different for us and so you can see that for the most part um, this, the difference in this approach is, um, dramatically affects um, metabolites of lower concentration, but also in some ways it also affects the metabolites which are of high concentration, such as NAA, um, especially if we use the default balance model, but also total creatine, glutamate. And you can see kind of the big effect, there are some big effects which you can see here, which is if you use default LC model, there's no way you can fit ascorbate. We know ascorbate is indeed there, and so we should be able to fit it, but the flexibility of the baseline, the baseline just picks up this um, signal and considers it to be part of the baseline. Um, similarly, GABA um, is very sensitive to what happens to the baseline, and you can see that in the approach where we use young macromolecules and stiff baseline, we lose it, and then in the ALS model um, analysis, we are actually, we are getting twice as high concentration of glutamate. So the effect of using um, non-H specific macromolecules and then using the um, flexible baseline is actually quite big on, um, on the whole neurochemical profile. And it's big enough in a way that you might lose um, the, um, the significant differences that we see in the aging brain. The kind of the differences that we see are somehow somewhat um, are within um, the um, what happens to the um, fitting of us. Um, so I'm going to move on. Um, I mean, you, yeah, feel free to stop me at any point in time if you have questions, but otherwise I'll move on and I will talk to you a little bit about this um, kind of probing intracellular environment. And so um, um, there is a paper which we published in, oh, I, um, I, it doesn't have a date, but I think it's 2013, um, looking at the relaxation times in older human brains. And this was the work which was done at four Tesla using a surface coil. And um, last year we kind of published an update looking. So in this case, we looked at only a dosipital lobe. And in this case, we are looking, we looked at three different brain regions. And we not only looked at T2, but also looked at um, uh, um, diffusion. And so um, kind of the way that I think about probing intracellular environment is, um, is using essentially the quantitative measures, but quantitative measure not for water, which is both intra and extracellular, but, um, but quantitative measures um, for, um, for different um, metabolites. And so um, in those, I um, consider T1 and T2 um, relaxation um, uh, time constants and apparent diffusion coefficient. So um, this is both kind of measured through relax relaxometry and through diffusion weighted MLS. And um, those measures are sensitive to cell size and shape. They're in, they are sensitive to water content, macromolecular content, um, iron, um, and also degeneration. Uh, iron accumulation and degeneration. So you can see here, this is the data from the, from the older paper, and you can see um, kind of here the difference between um, young and older. And you can see here that we see um, as big as um, almost um, as 23% difference between the T2 uh, obtained in young brain versus uh, uh, an older brain. So the, in older brain, we see the decrease um, in T2, um, and that decrease, the biggest decrease we saw was for, uh, for NAA. Um, so this is kind of a bu busy slides, but it's kind of um, um, gives you some similar information across, and, and, and except in this case, you can, um, it's done across three different brain regions. And so you can see here in young, um, you can see here for comparison for young versus older. And so you can kind of, you can appreciate but the T2 difference is there, um, even um, looking at them, um, looking at the um, looking at the data itself without even fitting the data, because you can see here the signal difference, um, how much less of a signal is left at this um, long echo time when you um, when um, 
for older as for a younger when um, everything is kind of um, done on a, shown on the same scale. And you can see that there is, um, um, that we have seen um, quite significant p-values and quite significant difference between young and older. Um, uh, for PCC, we see the similar thing for OCC. Um, in PFC, we still see some of the differences, um, but um, um, there is a lot of PFC data which was not nearly good enough quality for us to, um, to reliably um, fit T2. And so the amount of data that is, um, we are looking at for PFC is small. And this is similar data for diffusion weighted MRS. Um, and you can kind of appreciate the same thing here that you can um, see with the high B value, you can see that there is a signal difference between young and older. And you can kind of see, you can see, um, you can see those differences here as well. But the differences, the P values are much, um, much smaller. And the differences in terms of qua um, quantity is actually are actually much smaller as well. And so um, T2 is really um, seems to be actually more sensitive than the diffusion um, for getting the info uh, for seeing the differences between young and older. Um, the only thing I should mention is that this three Tesla data was collected on a um, standard uh, Prisma Siemens system. It was, um, it, there is no, um, the hardware that we use is exactly the same as the hardware that all the systems are. Okay. Um, so I will um, move on to Alzheimer's disease. And it's really kind of this study is a kind of, you can think of it as an expansion of our Aging 7 Tesla study. And so here, um, the equipment that we're using is exactly the same. We're using seven tests out of the 16 channel coil, and um, we're looking at two different brain regions. Um, and actually to the point that um, uh, we, in this case, we looked at so six, um, 16 older um, adults with mild to moderate AD. So they were, if they were, um, um, so they were not advanced AD, but pretty mild or, or early AD. Um, and we, you can see here, we use 33 older adults. And actually what, what happened with, is we combined, after collecting our data, we combined our older data who were um, in a control group for 60 people with Alzheimer's disease. And we combined the, the older data from the young and older study. We saw no significant differences between the data. We saw really the same data quality. And so we decided to just use, the, use all the data rather than um, removing part of the data. The sequence is the same. It's an ultra short echo time scheme. And here in this case, you can see um, that there is, um, and so this is PCC and OCC data. In this case, you can see that there is no dramatic difference in the uh, inequality of the data. And so before we saw this line with difference between young and older, um, here we, saw, we see no difference in terms of um, data, in terms of um, line with, uh, which makes sense. I mean, everybody's age match, uh, they're within the same age group. And so um, it's, um, it makes sense that the, that the data quality is very similar. And in this case, we saw um, only differences among three from 14 neurochemicals, um, where we saw increase in ascorbate, both in PCC and OCC. We saw the increase in myoinastal and choline in PCC, but no further really differences between the groups, uh, between the other. One of the things that we saw, which was very interesting, was that we had this nice correlation, especially for PCC, between ascorbate and myoinastal. And that kind of was very interesting to us because um, that potentially maybe gives us, maybe we do not need to measure ascorbate, which is relatively difficult to, me to measure. You have to have a really good quality data. And it's something which is impossible pretty much to measure at three tests. And so you have to measure this um, at seven tests. Uh, and so, may, but maybe myoinastal in some ways reflects some piece of the information from uh, that um, ascorbate has as well. So this is the first time that um, um, that the higher concentration of ascorbate has been measured in participants with the, uh, AD, and the first time um, that um, a, that um, we saw um, differences in OCC associated with AD. Um, 
I mean, the larger number of um, and size of neurochemical concentration difference measured in the PCC are consistent with the um, with the idea that there's a um, the that the PCC is affected is to affected by AD to a greater extent. Um, and so there may be um, that this distinct scenario in PCC and OCC may provide clues into mecha mechanisms underlying AD. And high um, ascorbate may be evidence of the pr uh, presence of peripheral leukocytes in the brain of older adults with AD. Um, it's kind of an interesting thought of where this higher ascorbate level is coming in. Um, and high myrinastal and ascorbate concentration may de uh, demarcate a transition from age associated um, pro, uh, pro inflammatory stage to the AD associated pathological neuroinflammatory response. Um, so, one of the things that we kind of looked at is um, we looked, we took all our data, I mean, we took our data from the data that we collected from kind of aging and, out, um, and a study of Alzheimer's disease, and we looked at the random forest analysis. And so we looked at the, um, how well can we um, distinguish between Alzheimer's disease and, um, and older adults. And so using this data, we had a, sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 97%. And so 14 out of 16 participants um, with AD were classified as correctly, and 32 are out of 33 controls. Um, the main, main, main predictors, which would not surprise you based on, um, on the data you saw, was um, were ascorbate and myorinastal in the PCC. Um, the other predictors were total choline in PCC, ascorbate, NIAG, and myorinastal. We also looked at if we add any um, structural information, is that going to make a difference? Is our prediction going to be better? Is our classification go is going to be better? And really, we did not see any difference in, in that classification. Um, we saw some very um, small changes in the performance, negligible per changes in performance measures, but and so none of the structural parameters um, was a major um, predictor. Although in our case, the the um, uh, the, um, those factors that we looked were um, a volume of um, interest gray matter, white matter, and CSF content. So we're not looking at the um, whole brain measures. We we're looking at the measures within our, uh, without, within our bus. Okay. Any questions? I mean, you can still ask them at the end, I guess. Otherwise, I'll switch to, um, I will go on with brain tumors. And so this is the kind of last, I guess brain tumors kind of will lead us all the way to the end of the talk. I should actually pay attention to time. Actually, I don't have much time. <laughs> okay, so, so let, let's go quickly. So um, brain tumors. Um, so diffuse uh, low-grade gliomas are really a heterogeneous group of brain tumors. And um, indication of a glioma subtypes is um, is crucial for planning and tailored therapies, especially that there are more and more tailored th therapies coming in. Um, and molecular markers and combination of the pathology improve both diagnosis and prognosis. And there are few uh, favorable um, prognostic molecular markers, which, uh, which we know about. One of them is IDH1 um, and 2 mutation, and which, um, which happens in oligodendrogdomas and um, astrocytomas. Um, um, there is a subclass of one, one when the uh, one uh, IDH1 and 2 mutated gliomas, which have 1P19Q codeletion, and that 1P19Q codeletion really happens in oligodendrogliomas. Oli oli so let's look at um, IDH mutations. Those are mutations of the genes encoding the enzymes isocitrate dehydrogenase one and two. And it, this was, um, it's a relatively, I guess, early discover, I mean, late discovery. I mean, it happened not so long ago. Um, it happens in 2009. So not, not very, um, not actually, not that long ago. And IDH mutations are, are found in nearly 90% of diffuse grade two, 60% of diffuse grade three um, gliomas, and um, 5% of uh, primary glioblastomas, and really absent in the other tumors. And the way this IDH mutation works is that um, we, um, that um, that the function of other uh, changes here and there leads to overproduction of D2 hydroxyglutarate. And there are two, the IDH1 mutation leads to overproduction of 2-HG in a cytoplasm, while 
um, in the mito uh, while IDH2 takes place in the mitochondria. Um, ID, um, the IDH1 mutation is by far the most common mutation. IDH2 is a relatively, um, it's a smaller, um, it um, affects smaller group of people, but um, IDH2 leads to a much higher concentration of 2-HG. So it gets, it um, ends up much easier to be, um, uh, to be detected. Um, and so one of the, th the first things we looked at was um, we looked at 2-HG quantification and compared two techniques which have been used. Uh, there are a few different techniques that have been used, but the two techniques which have been used quite a bit is um, this the optimized press where they are using a T of, um, of um, 97 milliseconds. So in a way, this is um, a form of editing, um, editing in a way of um, using a long T. And so you can see here um, when we compare healthy tissue to IDH wild type and IDH mutated, you can see um, in this um, in this spectrum, this is just kind of a standard press spectrum at 97 milliseconds. And you can see that there is no difference here in a signal, but here you can see the signal of 2-HG. But you can see that the signal of 2-HG is of course still overlapping with glutamate and glutamine. Um, and so it's not, a, it's not free of um, um, quantification problems. Um, if you do editing, and in this case, we're using megapress, although people have used also mega, la uh, mega laser. So if you look at this spectrum in a healthy tissue, this is a standard GABA, GABA edited spectrum. And, um, and if you look there, then um, you see no signal here. And similarly in wild types, but here there is a 2-HG signal. And two, this 2-HG signal is essentially um, free from contribution of any other metabolites. And so when you see this signal here, you can and um, very easily say that you have a 2-HG, um, you have 2-HG, and then you have an IDH um, 102 mutation. And um, so we did this in 24 um, subjects, and um, we saw a 2-HG peak in 20 of them, and in four of them we saw no, um, no peak. And we confirmed that um, every person in whom we saw that 2-HG peak um, was either IDH1 or RDH mutation. And you can see that the concentration range was quite, um, quite big from 0 0.17 to 5.8 millimolar. Of course, if you have something which is 5.8 millimolar, you have an easier time quantifying it. And so we looked then at the um, sensitivity, specificity, um, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value for um, um, 2-HG measured both with megapress and measured with press. And you can see that um, megapress has a really nice, uh, really nice performance, um, especially when we go to the Kramer-Lower bound of 999 by Alcinovo. If you cut them off earlier, then you lose a little bit of a sensitivity and depending on where your cutoff is, that sensitivity is a little bit different. And so as we, um, as we acquired this data um, and we looked at this data, um, we kept on um, we kept on seeing this. I mean, those are the normal GABA spectra. Um, in this case, we um, you can see here two HG peak, and here we saw nothing. But then there are certain group of people we kept on seeing this signal here, and this signal here, which we did not really know where it's coming from, it was showing up only in certain number of people, but but not in just one person. And so we decided to investigate. Um, investigate this. And so after some investigation, we decided that this, um, this um, resonance belonged to cystathionine. Um, and so we kind of, um, we started the investigation by thinking through of something which has to have a um, J-coupled partner around 1.9 ppm, but also which um, creates the biggest, um, the biggest resonances at 2.72 uh, ppm. And there's really not much in the normal um, spectrum which resonates there. And so this is how cystathionine looks like. It's a, re it's a relatively small um, molecule that you can see here. This is a pulse acquired spectrum uh, from 500 megahertz. And so you can, you can see um, how complex this um, pattern becomes. And part of the reason why it's complex is because um, every single um, proton in this uh, molecule is non-equivalent. So if you have the CH2 groups, neither, none of them are equivalent. And then some of them are strongly coupled. And so you end up having this kind of pattern um, where you do not see a when you do not see um, triplets, but you see some um, really interesting patterns, even at the, uh, at the high. 
And so we looked at what what people what we what people know about cystathionine. And so cystathione is in, is an immediate precursor of cysteine and glutathione in the transsulfuration um, pathway. It has a low concentration in normal brain tissue uh, when measured in ex vivo. In vivo, we have never seen it. Um, and then um, it had a, it has a higher concentration in brain tumors, and that was shown um, ex vivo. Um, and um, the highest concentration is observed in the tumors of the glial origin. But no studies at the point in time when we we're doing this work, no studies reported the detection of cystathione in, in vivo in either disease or normal human brain. And if we could see this in the normal human brain, essentially every single GABA spectrum should also show cystathione. So um, we, once we figured out what the molecule was, and once we, uh, we added it in, into, our, um, into our basis set, we're able to fit it. And you can clear, I mean, you can appreciate um, kind of from this data how um, high the cystathione, first of all, can be, and also how different um, the pattern looks, um, the brain um, that um, spectra looks between person who doesn't have cystathione and the person who has cystathione. Um, and so we observed this in 16 patients with glioma, and the concentration range from 0 0.2 to 4.1 um, millimeter. And so um, here is kind of, here is the cystathionine, um, 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 here's a me metabolism of cystathionine. So this is the transsulfuration pathway. And so you can see that cystathionine is here um, and kind of leading through um, from between homocysteine and cysteine um, and going through two, um, two, pathways from, two pathways from methionine and from glucose. And one of the things that we realized is that there were two enzymes, PHGDH and CTH, which were part of the um, metabolism of cystathionine. What is interesting is that both PHDH and CTH Right, um, lie on the 1P arm of the chromosome one. So they're located, and they're located in a little bit different places on, the, um, on this chromosome, but they're um, located on the, on the 1P arm of the chromosome, uh, on the P arm of the chromosome one. And so um, then we looked at, um, we split it, our groups into people who have who are IDH mutated by codedy, but not codedited and codedited. And so you can see here the difference in the spectrum. And you can see here this is an in vivo data um, showing that there is a um, concentration difference, a significant concentration difference between. Um, um, between people who have a 1P19 cubit codeletion and people who are not codeletion. And so we, um, we kind of further investigated um, the abnormalities in terms of um, different metabolites um, in between um, the two, group of, two groups of patients. And in this case, we are doing this, this is um, uh, amino acid concentrations, which are measured with um, li um, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. Um, and so you can see that this is now um, tissue analysis showing that there is a significant difference between the between codeleted and non codeleted You can also see that the serine is affected by it, where there is a difference um, and lower concentration uh, for codeleted. Um, or similarly, um, in glycine, there is a lower concentration as well. Um, we didn't um, see any um, we didn't see any significant difference for total glucotine. Um, and so we went further and looked at PHDDH and CTH expression. And in this, we looked at 33 tumors. Um, and so we, um, you could see that there is indeed a lowering of the expressions of the enzymes. And we confirmed this looking also at the public databases. I mean, so this is, this is our own data from the cohort, which we, um, which we used in the in vivo study, and this is our public databases. So um, what, we, what we see is essentially that there is a, in a non-codeleted non tumors, there is an increased um, reliance on CBS, CBS and CTH pathway. Um, and so, um, and do, it, that's happening due to this, due to the increased oxidative stress, which is happening um, here, um, wh where um, oxidative st has, um, stress is happening um, in the production of 2HG. Um, and through that, we see the increase in um, serine and glutathione levels in non-COVID. 
encoded in that glioma, we see decrease in serine and glycine levels um, due to most likely PHGDH um, deletion. And we at the same time see uh, cystathionine accumulation, uh, which most likely result from um, genetic loss of CTH and also um, even further overexpression of CDS. And so, um, so cystathionine can, so what we showed is that cystathionine can be detected non-invasively with MRS. Um, and so uh, we have a possibility of investigating in vivo cancer-specific metabolic pathways. Um, the cystathionine levels are significantly higher in I 1P19Q codeleted gliomas compared to gliomas without codeletion and not detectable in normal uh, tissue. So, and there is a selective vulnerability to serine and glutathione depletion in 1P19Q codeleted gliomas. Um, we detected um, this in minority of non-codeleted gliomas. Um, and so we think it's cyan so in vivo cystathione deletion is a candidate for as a marker of antioxidant activity, but it requires um, further collaboration with both in vivo and cell model studies. Um, in terms of non-codeleted gliomas, um, most times people, when they um, figure out the molecular markers, they look at the whole 1P19Q coalition, but there may be a partial deletion of just 1P or a certain part of 1P. And we don't have this information for every single uh, person. So I don't know, maybe I should skip this, um, or I mean, the end. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, so this is the, um, I may, I may need to just very quickly show you this. So this is um, a work which we have been doing, um, kind of if you, um, if you have ever been um, doing um, single voxel spectroscopy, you know that there's quite a bit of um, um, work that is um, happening every time you place a voxel. And so you can place a voxel in a, um, you can place a vaxel, I mean, if you are using normal anatomy, you can use anatomical markers, but when you have a lesion, um, it's um, kind of each person who will put the vaxel will put it in a different way. So here is, you have three examples of the placement of the vaxel that uh, potential users can come up with. And so we have been looking into um, an automatic um, vaxel planning. And so the way that we are thinking about this is you have essentially a lesion. Um, you have to have a lesion segmentation. So you have to have an information about lesion itself or where it is. And then you um, optimize the vaxel placement, place the vaxel, and then um, acquire the MRS data. And so we're looking at um, how to make this process automatic. Um, and we did this by um, looking at the vaxel placement um, properties from our retrospective um, manually placed MRS um, placements. And so you can see this is a manual placement where we um, look at two things. We're looking at the volume of the intersection between gold standard lesion mask and the MRS vaxel and then a fraction of the voxel that contains lesion. And so you can see kind of in this case, um, you have a, we want um, of course for the voxel to have pretty much um, all the, um, have only, only two more. And we also want um, that volume to be, our target volume was about eight milliliters. Um, when we go to um, lower, um, lower, um, uh, lower um, lower volume, then we're not getting as um, good of the data. And so here is a um, objective function which kind of reflects uh, reflects that information. And what we so what we did is we used, um, of course, um, so the, the the way this data was done, kind of in the way that we um, we used this information was we did this gold standard lesion mask, but the gold standard lesion mask was essentially done by combination of, of automatic and um, manual box uh, lesion segmentation, but that was done um, not during the time of the scan, but was done um, afterwards. Um, in this case, we're looking at um, finding a way where um, we can do the um, lesion segmentation um, on the fly, essentially. And so we were using the um, um, machine learning and CNN networks. We train these networks to do the um, to do the lesion um, segmentation. And so you can see kind of the lesion the examples of lesion segmentation with a dice score of overlap between the, our manual lesion and uh, and the lesion done by machine learning. Um, 
Um, and that sh kind of shows you that in, in, it's pretty good, it's not perfect. Um, and so we um, then looked at um, what happens when we do, um, when rather than us positioning the voxel, we allow the um, machine learning um, or AI to put position the voxels. And you can see here, um, when we did this for both training and validation set, um, so we train, we, you use training and validation test and a, uh, and, a, and a testing set. And so you can see that, I guess the biggest uh, things we take um, from that is that in terms of automatic, uh, we ended up having um, um, always better um, amount of lesion in a in a voxel, and then we tended to um, go towards um, towards a smaller a smaller uh, volumes. And so you can see kind of the examples here, where in this case, um, for example, your um, the automatic placement um, works in a way where um, there is no rotation, no obliquing of the voxel that is needed. And so we're hoping that um, kind of using these tools, will um, building this kind of tools will um, help to reduce the need for um, live and MRS expertise during a scan, which doesn't exist in all the clinical environments, and then also may provide more consistent MRS measurements for clinical trials and routine practice. Um, and so, yeah, I would like to um, thank you for your time and um, acknowledge um, um, the help and work of, um, the t of the team of people for each of those projects and then um, CMRR, all the other people at the CMR. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I particularly liked the, uh, the automatic voxel placement. I know we've been lucky that our voxels have been directly in the hippocampus, we can use anatomical landmarks, we're good to go, but uh, it's definitely something we considered. Um, so it's really neat to see somebody else actually doing something with it. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to either put them in the chat or speak up uh, or raise your hand, whatever you feel like doing. Jamie. Hi Goja, great talk, very nice work, really enjoyed uh, everything. Um, can I ask two questions? One is about uh, the co-deleted versus non-co-deleted IDH mutations. So can you just briefly, uh, maybe I missed it, but what is the, the sort of um, prognostic value of, of knowing that? I, I, is there a difference in terms of like a, a prognostic outcome for the patients who have co-deleted versus non-co-deleted uh, tumors? Yes, sorry, sorry I, be I became fast in that moment and forgot to say yes, actually. So if you have so if you have um, IDH mutation, you live twice as long as people who don't have IDH mutation. And then if you um, end up having one P19Q deletion, you, you live uh, longer than the people who don't have um, um, IP, uh, one P19Q deletion. Wow, so, so this is a uh, very exciting uh, kind of biomarker then. Yeah, so essentially, if you have one P19Q codedition, you will live you um, you will live um, the longest, I guess, of all of those, and your kind of trajectory of the disease is going to be very different than for the other people. Um, what is interesting, not so much yet for one P19Q, but for especially for IDH um, one and two mutations, there are a bunch of different. Um, um, therapies that people are looking at, which are completely, which are um, tailored, there are some of them which are purely ta tailored towards um, um, IDH mutation. And so you will, like, you will never get this um, therapy if you don't have that mutation. So the, the, the kind of the, the treatment is now diverging uh, if you have those uh, mutations. Great, thank you. And my other question is, um, it's about uh, choline. So oh, yeah. It's the metabolite that no one ever talks about, and my students know that uh, I'm starting to become obsessed with it. Um, you showed in your aging study that choline levels are higher in people in the elderly group, and then you showed again that in the AD group, choline levels are higher yet again um, than the elderly group. So clearly the choline, something's going on there. And then you showed, I think even in your, in your slide on, uh, on ITH, there was one slide it looked like the, the IDH positive group had massive choline levels compared to everybody else. Um, is anybody, are you or anybody you know looking into the significance like um, physiologically of what this means and, and what it's telling us about Alzheimer's and about aging and all that stuff? 
um yeah so i think calling like in terms of um in terms of like it, it's a big marker in cancer so everybody kind of is looking and it's like if you if you do breast cancer spectroscopy that's the only thing you're measuring is calling and there are a bunch of places where people have been focusing quite a bit on that um in terms of actually it's, it's interesting like the calling the variation in calling for brain tumors is very big and so it's um and depending on how you scale things, it may be significant. It's not between the groups. It's kind of a difficult, the, the, the variability is just huge. Um, in terms of calling for the, um, uh, for the aging or Alzheimer's disease, yeah, we're looking at it very closely, but it's kind of difficult. It's a difficult, um, it's difficult to disentangle why it's increasing. Um, one of the things I, I should say is like that if you that choline, um, even though it has so many protons, it actually doesn't get easy. It's not that easy to fit. And you actually tend to have more variability in choline fitting than in NIA or creatine fitting. Um, and so that's, um, and certainly that's the case if you want to measure, measure T2 of choline. It's really becomes, um, it's one of the more, one of the less reliable metabolites. Um, and so, yeah, I think we keep calling in mind. It's also, what is interesting is that somehow with in the aging, um, you end up seeing, and I think that's line with dependent, you end up seeing correlation between calling and PE in terms of fitting, not in terms of concentration, but in terms of fitting. Um, so you kind of have to watch out for few things. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, at the moment, we're not really um, taking it apart in terms of where it's coming from. I think that's a difficult question to answer, I guess. But it's definitely okay. the well, we're, uh... we're thinking about. It's not we're, we're not um, kind of forgetting about it. We're thinking about it, but we're not really I don't know um, how easy it will be um, to answer the significance of it in aging. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a question. Sure. Um, so we're doing a uh, MRS MRI behavioral study in an Alzheimer's disease rat model. Um, and we see, we see increased monoacetol. We do see some decreases in NAA, but our strongest effects are actually total choline, um, lactate and taurine. So I was wondering if in any of your previous work, um, or even in the human studies, if you noticed any increased lactate or taurine in any of your stuff. It's something I haven't really seen in the literature very much. Um, so I was just curious. So taurine, um, we saw a dramatic increase in taurine um, in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, but only specific mouse models of Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. So kind of depending on which model uh, we were looking at, we either got an increase of myelin acetal or we got an increase in taurine. Hmm. And I mean, they're both in an animal brain, both myelin acetal and taurine um, exist as osmolites. I mean, they have similar function in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so we definitely saw that. Lactate is an interesting one, but also a difficult one in animals because mm -hmm. it's so dependent on anesthesia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then it's not clear to me uh, if um, kind of different genetic models and the fact that you're mm -hmm. aging differently make you susceptible to anesthesia in a very different way mm -hmm. and so for me that always has been a question I mean I don't I don't have the answer I don't really I haven't done a study I I just saw that Mice, especially as they aged, um, had a very different um, kind of response to anesthesia. Um, and, and I wonder to what degree, I mean, sometimes I would see lactate levels that I would think that the mouse is dead. Um, and yet um, the mouse is perfectly fine. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think it was just a question of the... Um, Kind of how they deal with anesthesia and how much anesthesia you need to give them in order for them to be sedated. Hmm. That's interesting. We also um, 
we did an aging study in, in wild type rats and we saw similar increases in lactate and taurine. So in the AD rats, it's actually even further amplified. So I'm hoping it's not entirely anesthesia related, uh, but that is something that I would be need to look into more. So yeah, there are different, you know, I don't know what, which anesthesia did you use? Uh, isoflurane. I mean, isoflurane, like um, isoflurane, so, um, a while back, I published this paper on threonine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and in order for us to show um, that um, you can distinguish lactate and threonine, I wanted to produce a lot of lactate. And so to do that, I used isoflurane. Oh, no. If you go to um, Alpha Carlos, Alpha mm -hmm. Carlos generates far, far less, like the brain generates far, far less of the lactate. Uh, and so isoflurane is known for um, increasing quite dramatically the concentration of lactate, where la rather mm -hmm. than one millimolar, it's like 2.5 millimolar, even mm -hmm. if like in a rat on like on a normal um, functioning functioning brain. So it's like it's 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 the anesthesia which we um, use quite a bit to modulate lactate. I mean the. Uh, to the point, to actually to the degree that um, uh, isoflurane, like it just does because it's a, va a vasodilator, it all, mm -hmm. it does all kinds of things. And so, um, when we wanted to do, when we did experiments, um, we did some fMRI experiments with hyperpolarized carbon, and when we did those experiments, in order to see the um, stimulation of the paw, we actually went away from isoflurane mm -hmm. to alpha carlos because mm -hmm. they're just the effects of the anesthesia are big enough that you can actually even um, remove some of the functional effects of isoflurane um, in, in the brain. And so alpha mm -hmm. carlos is kind of nice for that. You end up seeing some more of that. I can, men I can mention that in a, in a human brain, um, there is definitely a lactate increase in um, um, in uh, um, in the aging uh, in the hmm. aging, um, and it's very easy to quantify lactate essentially in every elderly person. It's much more difficult to quantify um, lactate in a younger person. Mm -hmm. But the big diff um, one of the things one has to kind of be very careful about is um, that lactate and glucose exist both in CSF space, and you have mm. much more CSF space in the older population than the younger. Mm. And so we um, kind of stayed away from um, reporting lactate, um, partially because um, lactate is very much in a, um, in kind of an extracellular space in in a, in a CSF, and it's to quantify that like you would. You are, um, I mean, people quantify that by assuming certain concentration of lactate, but when we do that, it doesn't, the numbers don't quite add up, um, but it's an assumption of what, uh, what the concentration of lactate is. I mean, it's different in the animals because you don't have CSF in your vaccine and things like that, but it's a, um, lactate once again is one of those things which are more difficult to, on the human side in aging is more difficult to answer because of the CSF. Uh, I think in the animals, it's quite dependent on the anesthesia. That's awesome. Thank you. Very interesting. Something to, to put into my limitations section for sure. Um, if anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, if not, uh, I'll just say a quick thank you. Um, that was great. It was great that you were able to touch on so many different topics during the same talk. Um, it just shows the um, versatility of MRS, which is you know, what now one of my favorite modalities. So, um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, I know we can't really do applause, but um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much.